Thank you very much, um, Anthony. Um, this has been truly amazing. We've come to the final panel um, for the summit, and I'm really, really glad that we have an amazing set of panelists join us today. Um, our topic is bridging the gap. What can UK learn from Nigeria and vice versa? But most importantly, I really want to just talk about how we can leverage the power of collaboration to harness the potential of our ecosystem. Um, we both, we all know that there's amazing stuff going on in the ecosystem, but how can we be very targeted and deliberate in maximizing this relationship between UK and Nigeria to our benefit? And we're going to look at it across talent, across startups, across investment and governance and in looking at how we can both collaborate together. My name is Adeze Shoko, Country Director for the UK Nigeria Tech Hub. And I'm just gonna quickly introduce our amazing panelists real quick. Um, I have Kola Ino, who is the founding partner at Ventures Platform. Kola, hi, good to have you here. I have Dr. Ola Brown, who is the founder of Flying Doctors. Hi, good to see you. And I have TD, um, who is the collaborator in chief for TVC Labs, and Oluwa Duni Fani Bear, who is head of programs at Greenhouse Capital. You're all welcome. Before we get started, I'd like to encourage the audience to please leave comments in the chat box. Um, you could also leave questions in the QA chat, and I'll come back uh, between our session to try to answer some of them. So let's get started. Um, we've seen in the ecosystem a lot is going on. Um, which is great stuff. I miss the pandemic, I miss recession, I miss the fact that there's fuel scarcity, I miss the fact that there are power issues. Um, the tech sector is rising. I mean, they're, they're, they're closing deals, I think it's every day now. <laughs> it used to be every week. Um, and, and, you know, we're seeing, uh, we have six unicorns, um, some of us are, you know, coming up with innovative products, uh, we have a bill at National Assembly. Amazing things are going on. Is there is there any cause for concern here? Um, I, I mean, we already know that there's great stuff going on, but 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 are there are there gaps that we need to quickly close if we want to really ensure that we're not pouring water in the basket? And I'm going to start with Tommy Davis. We're going to walk around the table um, to answer that question. Turn me over to you. You're mute. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, there's always the danger of the bubble. And the, the concern some of us have is that we might have a lot of money chasing a few good startups. Um, and that's sort of the first first challenge. The second challenge, which I am sort of in the middle of and see more, is that of talent and the ability to actually um, apply or find the right talent to apply to scale. Uh, the third and probably final is around policy and the uncertainty of our regulatory environment um, because it tends to fluctuate and has its whims and caprices. So these three areas of risk sort of underlie the euphoria we are seeing, okay, with the exuberant valuations and investments uh, that are uh, heading in our direction. I trust that helps. That does. Um, I'll, I'll move on to Dr. Ola, and then Kola, and then Oluwadini. So, um, in terms of where we should be exercising caution, first of all, I'm just super excited about what I see in the ecosystem, and it's hard to be negative at a time that, you know, there's so much happening, and um, it's not just the funding announcements, right? It's the ecosystems that is igniting. Nigeria has the highest number of people almost in the world living in poverty. Um, and the amount of investment um, coming into um, Nigeria isn't just investments for those startups. It's actually igniting ecosystems in the informal sector. It's creating jobs um, and, you know, really beginning uh, to lift those people out of poverty. 
um, and that's you know super exciting from my perspective. But what what do we have to be cautious of? Um, I think from an economic policy perspective, um, the monetary policy system around access to finance, a lot of these companies um, have raised significant amounts of equity capital, but sometimes they need working capital, sometimes they need venture debt, um, and that's not as available in our local market. They need access to Naira as well as dollars, um, and that's becoming more important. Um, and that's something that we need to build, and we're already at the Flying Doctors Healthcare Investment Company building around that. Um, the second thing is around the value of the currency and the stability of the currency itself. Um, and um, they're raising in dollars um, at dollar valuations, um, whilst the value of the underlying Naira isn't that stable. Um, and we really need to sort out from an economic policy perspective how we can put measures in place to um, stabilize the currency or at least know what to expect. Uh, from the currency perspective and that's something you know that we, we should be um, sort of advocating for um, in terms of economic policy and seeing how we can and obviously the startups are part of the solution right foreign direct investment um, and dollars coming into Nigeria are a big part of the solution that will start stabilize it uh, that will start to stabilize the currency but in terms of doing whatever we can do um, to ensure that we, we, we do have a predictable um, value of our currency um, is important um, and then I'll echo um, TD on the talent issue. Um, we do have issues around brain drain, um, but I don't think that's so much of an issue as it once was. Um, I think pre-COVID, um, it would have been a bit of a nightmare, but now we do have um, a global talent pipeline. So as as people leave Nigeria, you know, we're, we're hiring talent from across Africa, we're hiring talent from across Eastern Europe, um, we're working with people in South America, um, with diverse skill set um, and really a skill set and beginning to really work in um, in global teams. So I think, you know, talent may be an issue, but not so much of an issue as um, it was pre-pandemic when we all thought that, you know, if you weren't in the office, you weren't working. Um, and then the last thing is um, around early stage investments and making sure that we have a good pipeline um, of early companies, um, good general partners um, that are diverse um, around, um, that are sort of diverse in nature. So we're not leaving women behind. Um, if you notice the statistics <laughs> around these raises um, uh, are quite disappointing from, um, from a woman's perspective. Um, when you look at mixed teams, um, it's not so bad, but when you look at solo female founders, um, it's less than 5% of the total funding raised. Um, 1%. Less than 1%. Less than 1%, 1, less than 1 of the total found, um, funding raised. I wanted to say 5 because I didn't want to make it sound so dramatic on the panel. Um, but yeah, it's less than 1% of the total funding raised. Um, and I think that, you know, this is, this is an issue. Um, part of the reason is capital allocators. There are not enough female allocators of capital. Mm -hmm. I've been a GP in a fund, raised our first fund in 2015. Um, and I was actually probably one of the only female GPs at the time in the whole of Nigeria. That is gradually changing, but not changing fast enough. Um, and you can't really transform an economy um, if half of the population are left behind. Um, and in order to change the capital allocation, the way that the people that allocate the capital has to change, this has been historically um, a domain that has been um, sort of dominated um, by men. Um, and I think that, you know, having diversity in capital allocation is important as well. Um, and that's sort of my last area of caution. So macroeconomics, definitely, as an economist, of course, I'm going to say that. Um, I, and I'm not, you know, um, TD mentioned about the bubble as well, but I don't, you know, I don't really, I'm not like a bubble person per se. Well, I, like, I lived through the 90s dot com bubble. I, I was, I was going to go further <laughs> than that. I was going to go further than that. I was going to talk and about, I, um, all the I was going to talk about around. David and Solomon in the Bible. And I was going to talk about the fact that, you know, recessions and um, recessions and bubbles of been part of our history. Obviously, you know, King Solomon in the Bible was able to actually build all that infrastructure because he was living through a boom period. And all of the rest of the biblical kings 
you know, some of them had to work through recessions and they didn't look as great as him because he was the one striking all the trade deals, right? Um, so this has been, you know, part of our history. We've lived through booms and busts and we've, we've built company, resilient companies. So I wasn't even going to the 90s. <laughs> I was going to probably like 5,000 years before that. Um, so, and, you know, if you can remember the tulip bubble, for instance, when like everybody in England and the whole of Europe was like crazy about these tulip bulbs and tulip bulbs were going for a thousand times the price. Um, so we've lived through bubbles and, and resilient companies come out of bubbles. Um, so I think there's things that capital allocators have to remember when they're working in boom periods and things that um, we have to remember when we're working um, in it during recessions. But pro-cyclicity, uh, pro um, which is the feature of the economy that makes you know um, economies go up and down, is something that we've lived for for millennia, with for millennia. Um, and um, it's something that, you know, um, hasn't, particularly um, affected um, innovation. There's a lot of things that central banks can do to prevent the effects of bubbles being so drastic, but it's something that um, will be a feature of our economies for many years to come. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ala. And I'd like you to build up on that point when, we, when I go to my next question. Um, but, but let's hear from, from Kala. Hi, everyone. Delighted to be here. I guess the you know interesting conversation so far. I need to learn um, a virtual panel lighting from from all the beautiful people in here because I noticed that my screen is the darkest, uh, so that's challenging. <laughs> but um, no, um, look, I think like like the Tola said, um, there's there's so much to be to be excited about, right? Um, and I think if if there's anything to celebrate, I I want to highlight two things that that. You know, you have, you have pointed out one is just the resilience of this ecosystem that despite, you know, all all the odds and everything that's happened, um, even you know, globally, that's now impacting Nigeria with commodity prices and, and fuel, the ecosystem just seems to continue to 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 to, to sort of surge and, 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 move, and move ahead. Uh, and then on the flip side, um, we have a we have a bill in the in Parliament that that was that that has gotten this far through the collaborative effort of the ecosystem. Um, there's nothing nothing like of that nature has happened ever, at, at least that I know. Um, you know, in such an open collaborative manner. And so I think there's a lot to be proud of um, uh, within the ecosystem. But that, but 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 that's not to discount uh, as you identified. Uh, some causes for concern. I, I want to double tap on the point on talent that TB identified. Uh, and what we're really seeing is that as the ecosystem, as the valuations rise, as the capital invested rises, uh, as attention is shown on, on the quality of our talents, not only are you having uh, um, talent flight, but you're also having the fact that the early stage companies are getting priced out of the market for talent. And so we really have to think um, uh, uh, deeply about the state, not only the supply of talent, but the staging of talent, right? Uh, how do you, you know, you've got, well, if it's technical talent, you need to think about talent at the different stages, the, the senior stage, the intermediate stage, and the junior stage. And work has to be happening at each of those levels um, uh, to, 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 really, to, to really make that happen. Investment also has to happen for the kinds of infrastructure that talent would require to remain in in Nigeria and, and you know uh, and continue to work in these companies, um, uh, the second thing I want to identify, uh, and I'm no economist here, uh, Dr. Ola takes that credit, but she's already identified the macro trend. You know, and people, some people often say that uh, our ecosystem or the startup ecosystem is immune, tends to be immune from the macro. Or disconnected from the macro, because in reality, uh, this ecosystem has grown regardless of what the macro uh, picture has looked like over the last two years. But I think you can only stretch that up so far, right? It gets it gets to a point that uh, there's a point you get to where uh, companies the the gravity of the macro really starts to weigh down on on, on companies, whether whether it be the evaluation, whether it be political risk, whether it be uh, issues around um, uh, devaluation and, and the impact of all those macro trends on the share of wallets, uh, which 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 can continue to shrink if um, if if we don't start to sort of correct those concerns. 
uh, and, and these have only been worsened uh, by uh, the, the, the conflict, you know, in Ukraine and uh, with Ukraine and Russia and, and, and the price of uh, of fuel globally. So, so that's something to watch, uh, and, and is a, I think is a cause for concern. Um, uh, the, the third point I wanted to identify is not. I don't see it as as so much of a bubble, as I as, as I see it as a concern about the impact of hot money and all the momentum, and the fact that while the local ecosystem for capital has grown. I mean, in the last five years or six years, you you have you know you have a bench platform, you have Future Africa, you have Micro Traction. At the latest stage, you have TLCom that's an the new fund. Uh, you have several other funds that have come on stream. Um, uh, it's it's not quite uh, it's not quite we're not quite there yet. And so the the what you have to worry about is uh, if we don't have um uh enough local capital or even international capital that is committed to the region for the long term what does that mean what happens when uh the next flavor of the month shows up or the next flavor of the quarter shows up right uh, and the capital starts to dry up and so this is why i think we require two things you know we need more uh, uh, uh local capital allocators uh, that maybe work with global LPs or even local LPs. Uh, for our first close, we had about 8% local, local LP participation, and that was really deliberate uh, for our fund. But also, when you have foreign sources of capital, I think, you know, um, you know, I hope they're building local teams, you know, to show a commitment to, to you know, QED just did something similar. Uh, there's, there's, they have two team members that are Nigerian. That for me is a good show of commitment uh, and suggests to me that they're interested in the in the region for the long term. Uh, and so, and so, and so that 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 is something I think we need to think about um, as 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 a as an ecosystem. The last thing I want to mention is just the whole notion of equity in general. And and I think we can think about this first off uh, from a gender standpoint. There's not, you know, that's already been identified. There's not all the the growth in funding hasn't necessarily uh, been been equitable, uh, and, and and really kudos to to all the amazing people doing work on that. But also in terms of verticals, right? Uh, fintech seems to be taking a continues to take a large chunk of of the capital in the market. Um, but it's all it's connected, right? It's connected to what GPs, the incentive of GPs, and what LPs are looking for. And so I think. You know, we need more equity, more diversity in, in the investor pool um, and, and, the, and the investment strategy. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, lots to celebrate, but lots to also uh, double tap on and think about a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kola. Oluwadini, what say you? Um, I was really hoping not to go last. <laughs> and not to be cliche. Um, Paula, Dr. Ola, and TB have um, given very interesting answers. I was going to touch on gender as well as talent. But um, just to sort of answer the later part of your question, so you asked about um, areas of concern and what can be done to improve. Um, so something that no one has spoken about is, I don't want to be repetitive, so I would just... <laughs> leave out the gender um, okay. and talent. Um, what we're seeing now is, so just on the legislative part of things, um, I think the startup bill is great. I think that um, it's a great move. We've seen how it worked for Kenya, how it worked for South Africa and Senegal. So it's a good move for Nigeria. I think it's great that um, we also have um, key players in our ecosystem guiding that on the legislative side. I hope that continues. Um, but what I think is important as well is we currently see a lot of Nigerian startups, um, you know, um, Nigerian startups expanding into other African countries. So I think what will be interesting is to um, maybe take the legislation from just within Nigeria to, um, you know, maybe 
an agreement between Nigeria, the government of Nigeria and the government of Senegal or the government of Nigeria and the government of Cote d'Ivoire because our startups are expanding within Africa. And that expansion process is currently quite difficult. Um, so yeah, I think that will be interesting to see. Thank you very much. Um, so, so I'm going to go to the second question. I'm going to start, go back again to um, Mr. Tomi Davis. And you did highlight uh, key areas that, that are very key for us to pay attention to. And and uh, Kola was saying that we can only stretch the lock so far, meaning that there needs to be deliberate and targeted approaches to dealing with these concerns. If uh, we're not going to have another case like like oil, and, and, I, and I, I, I don't know if you understand what I mean. Um, but, but the big question is, how do we ensure that we are deliberate with collaboration? How can the UK play a role in ensuring that um, we do minimize these shocks, right? And really harness the potential and these opportunities that we're seeing. Um, the UK government has done work in the ecosystem, like, you know, providing scholarships for talent development, supporting local capital allocators, you know, through its Angel Investing Academy, supporting women entrepreneurs, supporting the startup bill. I mean, there's still more that can be done, but if we're going to be priority, if we're going to prioritize support, so that we are really targeted. And that's why I asked the first question. So when we sit at the table, we know exactly what we are asking for. And we are channeling the, the, the limited resources that we have to support the ecosystem. So how can the UK really play a more targeted role in addressing the, these gaps? Tommy. Um, well, to my mind, I think uh, you've highlighted some of the great work that the UK government is already doing. Um, I think there are a few things we could still learn and borrow from the UK in Nigeria. Uh, so for example, I'm a big fan of the SEIS scheme. I would say that I'm an angel investor. Um, it's one that, um, again, I believe we should be looking at to encourage more local investment. I know people have said, oh, but we don't pay tax anyway. Um, why, should, why would anybody be bothered? But I think that's exactly, you know, the whole point is the fact that if you invest, you can write off almost all your taxes against startups. Now, if you say that and, and find a way, for example, to incentivize local investors into that tech ecosystem, you do more, okay, even without incentives, look at what's happened. You know, I mean, look at Flying Doctors, look at Greenhouse Capital, look at Ventures Platform. You know, um, all of them, bar none, started with direct personal individual investments. Now, if those are incentivized, that would go a long way. And that's the thinking behind SEIS and the, even EIS, which is, which is for later, more mature companies. So that's one particular area I think uh, we could borrow from uh, the UK on. Um, I think in addition that um, sort of helping, uh, and I don't know how to put this, uh, but there are an increasing number of structures that are being created within the Nigerian environment to support this ecosystem, sort of strengthening those because our challenge in Nigeria are our institutions. We lack institutional capability. And anything that can be done to strengthen institutional capability, okay, by the UK government, uh, I think would go a long, long way because consistency is one of the other fundamental things that you don't see. So yes, somebody comes in, does it exceedingly well, we take a dip the next time and we keep waiting for the next Messiah to sort of res resuscitate the institution. I'm gonna leave out names, but I think you get that, that fundamental principle. Um, and the third and final area is sort of this, this cross, cross that, the, the, the knowledge exchange. And knowledge exchange, not at a generic level, but at a deep fundamental level where those that are coming 
even fresh out of university looking at entrepreneurship uh, in the tech world can access pools of knowledge and you know aside from just pure cash capital but how do i start how do i register you, you so somebody talked about new zealand in half a day how do i register my company in nigeria the startup bill is now with us what does it mean to me they sound mundane but just empowering that level of of knowledge exchange i think is is something else that um so that could be helped with those are three areas i think we could probably take a look at in terms of how we can enhance the relationship between both of us i trust that helps that helps thank you very much for those three points so looking at the seis scheme strengthening institutional capability and knowledge exchange i'm going to go to lower duni just so that you don't speak last this time um what are your what are your thoughts on how the uk and nigeria can be more deliberate thank you for, thank you for um, allowing me to not go last again um <laughs> so top of mind for me is and this ties back to um, the talent issue that paula spoke about earlier um i think that it's i think that um maybe continuing to develop high quality programs for talent and not just developing high quality programs for talent also following that up with possible partnerships and placements in um in um successful startups within the country um and just to circle back a bit concerning the program so i find that a lot of programs are targeted at engineers even when color was speaking he only spoke about engineers but there's so many other um, pieces um, to it. There's communication, there's compliance, there's legal. And, you know, it's it's usually, if you're on the recruiting side of things, it's very difficult to recruit for those non-technical roles because people aren't just capable enough. So I would say um, developing programs that cater to the technical side as well as the non-technical side as well as following up the programs with partnerships with tech startups, block away, pay staff, you know, and just agreements of placements, internships, whatever works for both sides. All right, thank you very much. So quality talent programs and placement. And and by quality, just to, are we talking, because it, if you listen listen to all the conversations in the in the last two days this has come up right but we can't seem to agree on what quality is do we have quality institutions in nigeria that can be supported to prove to to churn out quality non-tech and technical talent are we saying this is where the uk can now take on some talent um some play, play this role in in providing that that um human cap capital development that's yes, needed. I don't. I don't think that. Um, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to be politically correct, but I'm. I don't think that the current institutions we have, you know, are doing such a great job. So I think there's definitely a gap that the UK can fill. All right. Thank you very much, um, Kala. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, uh, Tommy and Oluwa Dunia have made some great points already. Um, I'll just add two things. I think one is there's a great deal of B2B collaboration that can happen, I think, between both nations, especially as um, as uh, our fintechs and some of our other startups begin to scale. Um, I, think, I think creating those pairs um, uh, would be would be an, one opportunity to explore um, between between our two countries. Um, the, the the second thing that I think really still baffles me, and I think um, um, Dr. Ola and I, as well as you, at Daisy, were at dinner with um, with uh, the minister recently. The UK minister for Africa. Yeah, the UK minister for Africa, and I think I I brought this up even at on that in the, at that event that really with the proximity that we share, it baffles me that we that that the U UK venture capital is not is not leading the charts when it comes to uh, 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 global VC participation in Nigeria, right? For me, it's a missed opportunity. 
uh, if you think about time zone, if you think about language, and if you just, if you think about the share volume of Nigerians uh, in the UK diaspora, and so that is that is a missed opportunity. I'm not versed enough to speak to what needs to happen to change it, but I think that's something that needs to change. Uh, we, we also explored the topic um, of um, today when 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 startups in Nigeria want to international internationalize. The UK doesn't come first on the list, right? Um, uh, domiciles like Delaware, more recently, uh, the UAE uh, would typically come first, right? Uh, and so that those two points, uh, more venture capital from the UK and the UK really positioning itself as an international destination, I think is is is, is again. I don't. I, I didn't. I want to make this a balanced conversation, so I, I didn't. I, I you know. I wanted to share what you know, talk, double tap on what the yeah. people think of it. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, Justin, just to build up on that, just in general conversations, do you know if do you know why why startups are more prone to other areas like the UAE or America? Do you know well, why it yeah. might be slow in Nigeria? Is it a, well, is it a market it barrier issue or something? Yeah, yeah, I think it's related to the first point on on just you know, access to venture capital, right? Like, like you know, to U.S. investors, uh, you know, uh, are the most likely to invest today. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about commercial venture capital, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. and so by default, you know, companies would tend to dump sell there, and everyone else globally would would follows Delaware and is happy to invest in a Delaware pro. Um, and so you have to sort of lead with with your checkbook in some way right and this goes beyond um, the great work that the cdc and the dfis from the uk are doing uh, i think we need more commercial investors to get in the in the fray okay um, before i go to thank you very much for that okay hello Adini, you wanted yes, to chip in I, yes i was going to chip in um just before we move on to dr ola I'm not sure how long it takes to register a business in the UK. I'm not because I, I haven't tried, but I know if you're doing it in Delaware, it's it's you can do it in less than a day. So that's probably also one of the reasons because it's so easy and so quick. Yeah, I just wanted to add that. So well, it, add it, that. it doesn't take a day in the UK. So valid point. And I don't I don't think that they're not they're not APIs yet. You can't quite. <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy. It's much easier in the US. No. Okay. Okay. So if, if the UK is going to be a really good partner with the tech ecosystem, um, it would need to fine tune some of those things that um, Nigerians are getting from other countries uh, in terms of registration, in terms of even its efforts in the ecosystem. Um, so it needs to, is, is there anything in particular that it would need to so probably like a niche that the UK will need to create. And, and I'm going to throw this to um, Dr. Ola and, and, and then uh, told me to, to weigh well, in as well. Well, we've, 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 just, okay. been, we've just been corrected in the comments by someone that says it takes 15 minutes in the UK. So I stand corrected. Uh, <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you very much. So it takes, it takes 15 minutes probably going back to what Tommy David says about knowledge exchange people didn't know that um but does it does it make a difference now that it takes 15 minutes do you think I don't think it's around ease of incorporation um I think incorporation is one issue but I think it's around being an attractive um destination for incorporation for other reasons uh, uh, incorporation the ease on timing of incorporation isn't the only reason why people uh, choose Delaware. People choose Delaware because it's um, acceptable to investors. People choose Delaware because um, it's an it's an international destination where people from even even if you have investors from from Asia, for example, um, they feel comfortable putting their investment in the Delaware Corp. And there they, there are other things that come with the De Delaware Corp as well. So it's easier to. It, and the funny thing is that actually, in terms of financial services and in terms of legal services, these are two things that the City of London is actually the most famous destination in the world for. Yet that support being available to startups in the package that Delaware offers it um, 
isn't it isn't exactly the same um, in terms of not the ease of incorporation, but in terms of the legal support services that you can layer on top of that, um, and um, the sort of financial services that can be lay, um, layered on top of um, uh, on top of that as well. Um, so in terms of incorporation, I think that that's a big, a really, really big issue. Four billion dollars of capital was raised last year by um, um, African startups, and most of that did not come into Africa. It went into Delaware. Um, so um, if you, if the UK, I mean that is money, and you know we're looking at probably 10x of that money, so 40 billion dollars in the next 10 years. Um, so that is a genuine opportunity um, for UK and Nigeria con uh, collaboration. And I think one point that I wanted to touch on was around exits. Um, and this is something perhaps maybe I should have mentioned in the first, um, in the first uh, session or the first question that you asked around things that we should be cautious of. And I think one of the things that we should be cautious of is of course, you know, money is going into these companies, but we don't have the advanced um, system of mergers and acquisitions and local acquirers um, that would be present in a market like America or even like China. Um, so what happens when these companies need to exit and where do they exit to? Um, our stock exchange locally right now in Nigeria doesn't have the level of liquidity um, that one would need to exit. And um, so like Jumia, I think a lot of our startups would be following um, the Jumia route to exit on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, but why not the London? So I think that one area of con collaboration would could be potentially for our startups um, to have the option of listing on the London Stock Exchange, how they would do that and how it would become as attractive um, as, as, the, as the New York Stock Exchange. I think there needs to be some thinking around that. Um, so the LSE is one and then mergers and acquisitions both ways. Um, so I've been on the board of the British Business Group now for three years and one of our major jobs um, is to bring in uh, British companies and sort of help them acclimatize to the Nigerian environment um, that want to do business in Nigeria. Um, and I think, you know, trying to encourage more of that cross pollination through trade missions, etc., would be a really good way to look at both ways, um, whether a UK startup um, would be interested in acquiring a Nigerian startup to improve their access to Africa, sim um, similar to what Stripe did, the strategy for uh, Stripe and Paystack, or whether um, a Nigerian uh, startup may want access to the European market and might want to choose London as a base and choose to acquire um, a UK startup. So trying to encourage that cross-pollination is definitely one way um, that we can have liquidity events, which is important for maintaining that flow of capital, because once, you know, the providers of capital find out that there aren't liquidity events, then they're going to stop investing. Um, and then number two, obviously, um, yep. encouraging, it, it helps both, e kind of cross-pollination helps um, both ecosystems. So um, trade missions, deal rooms, virtual deal rooms, um, panels are important, but I think um, places and environments where deals get done um, are even more important. And I think investment as well, um, particularly um, through um, organizations like the CDC, um, you know, I feel that that's, that process of capital allocation, both to startups and to capital allocators can be streamlined, um, particularly um, with regard to gender lens, gender lens investment, um, so that more capital actually comes into the ecosystem. But my main points are around exits, um, around, incorporation around policy support as well. I know it's been mentioned before, but structural policy in Nigeria, ease of doing business, macroeconomics, um, recommendations and advocacy is important as well. Access to markets and and, and investment are sort of my main um, source of um, thoughts around how to improve um, collaboration between Nigeria and the UK. And um, hopefully my suggestions are things, or I've, I've tried to tailor my suggestions to things where both ecosystem win um, because we're talking about the issues in our ecosystem but there's obviously issues in the UK ecosystem as well um, in terms of the dynamism um, compared to the American ecosystem and when I speak to startups based in the UK um, you know they complain that they have to achieve higher metrics than their equivalent um, American equivalents to be able to attract the same amount of funding um, so I think that a collaboration between Africa and the UK is not just important for Nigeria, it's actually important for the UK. Um, and that way together, we can we can really develop um, a much more collaborative and a much larger, more dynamic um, ecosystem 
um, where we can trade between ourselves and hopefully um, begin to see some of those valuations and some of those um, some of those amounts of capital that um, go into the American startups. Thank you very much. We do have two minutes left um, um, for this conversation. And just before I summarize all the great points that I'm going to take back with me and make sure that the next time we come back here, we'll just be talking about all the great stuff that we've been doing uh, between UK, UK and Nigeria um, and the progress that we've made. Um, I just want to give us um, just one minute, if you can just go around and give any final thoughts, just starting from um, Mr. Tommy Davis, and then we'll go around um, the table like that. Over to you. Actually, I think you've heard just about everything, so I'm quite comfortable that we've covered all the bases. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Olua Denny. Uh, yes, um, thank you for having me. Um, I think that we all made solid points, just as Dr. Ola was speaking. I was thinking in my head, oh, how do we make the LSE um, the next NASDAQ, you know? Um, so yeah, solid points. I picked up a few things from all the speakers, but yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Luatini. Uh, Kola. No, it's been a great conversation. I mean, the only point I'll make is, you know, I think the Nigerian ecosystem is is is, is, is moved way beyond being a charity case or, or, or a development case. Uh, it's a it's a very commercial case now, and so hopefully we we can uh, get some more UK capital in the fray. Thanks for having me. Take care, guys. Well, thank you very much, Kola. And um, Dr. This is a conversation that's really close to my heart because um, I feel as much British as I am Nigerian. I lived, I started living in Nigeria 10 years ago and up until that point, I was born and raised, not even in London, um, in a tiny town called Lower Stoft on the East Coast. Um, so even going to London or Manchester was kind of like a big deal for me because they were like super big cities compared to where I grew up. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is um, an evolution or has been an evolution historically in tech where uh, China and America um, are the big power blocks. And I feel like there's a really unique opportunity um, for the UK and Africa to work together to form our own block as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I do believe there's an opportunity for us to really collaborate together with the UK and form that nice corridor to really uh, power our economy, minimize shocks, and ensure that you know the tech sector doesn't become a resource course. And I think that's for me is the major major thing that irks at my soul. And, and I think just taking all the key points around, you know, looking at, you know, what we can learn from the UK, uh, Mr. Tommy Davis talked about the SEIS scheme for, for, for providing incentives for, for angel investing, talked about the need to strengthen institutional, uh, uh, our institutions and policy, talked about the need for knowledge exchange so that we know how to harness the opportunities that both sides have to offer. We've talked about quality talent programming, which is like the number one issue that has come up throughout the conversation. The need for more trade missions, um, you know, just to foster those partnerships and conversations, the need to cross-pollinate ideas. And looking at uh, investment, financial capital, um, I mean, the CDC has been doing great, but, but there's more to do, especially also looking at uh, bearing in mind uh, gender, that our gender lens. Um, so, so, so all of these key points are, are, are taken into consideration. And I should just say that you all hit the nail on the head because these have come up in all the different sessions across the two-day day summit. I think we know what to do. I think we understand that we need to be cautious, even though there's there's great stuff happening. Uh, we need to make sure that we actually are channeling all this opportunity for for the good of of the economy. Um, and, and for the good of the country. So, so thank you very much for all these key points. They are noted. Thank you everyone for being a great, uh, a great audience um, and, and for participating. Um, and I, I believe that we're going to take all, the, all of this feedback and, and do something great. Um, by next year, we will have something uh, better to report on. Thank you very much, Kola. Thank you very much, Dr. Ola. Thank you very much. Mr. Tommy Davis, thank you very much, Oluwadini, and over to you, Anthony.